Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and we continue our study in Daniel today. Now, before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our sins and that we have allowed the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity, the time, the privilege we have to study your word. We ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. We are studying the book of Daniel, chapter 11, and we have been learning about the person who's going to come in the future, we call him the Antichrist. He is a person who will claim that he is the Christ, and yet he is evil. He will pretend to be the person that everyone's waiting for to save the world, to deliver the world, to bring them prosperity and happiness, and yet he is actually deceiving everyone. We saw how he rises to power as a ruler in a place the, ba the Bible just calls Babylon. And what we've learned about Babylon is that it becomes an evil power where there's idols and there's demons. And basically, this is a place that promotes sin. He first becomes the leader there. We learn that he does this by treachery and deceit. And intrigue, that means he's real slippery. He's slick. And then he moves over to the area of Europe in what we call Rome I because the Roman Empire, which we've studied several times in our book of Daniel, was the most powerful nation in the ancient world. And then over years, about three or four hundred years after Jesus had went to the cross and resurrected, that empire lost its power, broke up, and basically became Europe. Well, when the Antichrist comes, he first rises in Babylon, this powerful evil power. It's not Europe. It's another place. Then he moves over to Rome 1, which is basically the old Rome back during the days of Jesus and the apostles. And then he will expand his empire, making it larger beyond the borders of what it was during the times of Jesus, and we call it Rome 2. So Rome 1 is basically the old Roman Empire, and Rome too will be the new revived Roman Empire. He expands his empire by moving from Europe into the south, the southern kingdoms that are mostly in the Middle East and Africa. He does this by invading them. And we've learned that this invasion is the taking down of those three horns. Seven of the horns are in Europe and Israel, includes Israel. And then he moves in to take down the other three, making a total of ten, which we've seen on the different images and prophecy. The ten horns are 
maybe the ten heads, depending on what passage we're looking at. But these three are the southern kingdoms. The southern kingdoms. Now, let me suggest that you or your parents get out a map that shows this area of the world. You can do it on the internet, on Google, and you can see the nations of Israel <coughs> and those that are surrounding it. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. Israel's a little bitty country here. But around it, you have such countries as Syria, Lebanon, up here is Turkey. Down here, we know about Egypt. Over here is Saudi Arabia. And then around Saudi Arabia, you have a lot of little countries that are around the outskirts of it. Okay? Up here, you have. Afghanistan, I'm just going to put AF, you have Iran, over here towards that direction you have Pakistan. So as you look at this map, you understand that these here are the southern kingdoms. Part of these countries, some of them, were once under Rome's control. But now, from what we tell, can tell, the Antichrist will take over all of these areas. They are divided up into three kingdoms. We're not told exactly how they're divided up, but let's say they're this way, one, two, and three. He will come down and he will begin to conquer them. All right? Now remember, he's up this direction in Europe. So if we were to make a little small, uh, well, we would draw a map that covers more area. and have this as the Mediterranean. Well, let me start over. You would have, because the Mediterranean is basically a, a place that is pretty much surrounded by Europe up here. And then you have Egypt down here and Africa. Okay, here's the Middle East. So, Rome 1 will be up here. As he expands south, all of this becomes Rome 2 together, you see. Now, what we're studying now is his first invasion from the area of Rome 1 to these southern kingdoms. Daniel 11.25 The first invasion of the south and with that he will have his first and I've used this word, I want you to learn it desecration. It's a long word but what it means is, is he doesn't destroy it but he so changes it that he makes it something it's not supposed to be. All right? Like if someone was to come in and, let's say, to an old bank building, and they decide to make it into a gas station. And they take out the safe, and they take out all the, the teller booths, and they make it a gas station. Well, they've really changed it, haven't they? But that's not really what desecration means because desecration means they make it something bad. So what he does, he takes the temple, the place where people worship God, and makes it to a place where they will worship the Antichrist. So he makes, he not only changes it, but he desecrates it. Okay? That's the word desecration. Daniel 
25. Let's begin to look at his first invasion to the south. He, that's the Antichrist, will stir up his strength and his courage against the king of the south with a large army. The king of the south will mobilize an extremely large and mighty army for war, but he will not be able to prevail because of the plans devised against him. Well, let me explain some of this. This tells us that the Antichrist will, in, will invade the three kingdoms of the south, which, if you remember, will probably be headed, ruled by one king, uh, actually a Muslim leader. They look forward to him today. They call him the Mahdi. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us there will be a Mahdi. But from what we can tell, there will be a one king over this area. So he would be like the king of the south over these three southern kingdoms. So he may be the Mahdi. So you have this southern king. We'll just call him the king of the south over these three southern kingdoms in the Middle East. All right, and also North Africa. So he covers not only the Middle East, but North Africa. And the king of the north will go down there the king of the south will have a large army also. But, the king of the south, even though he has a large, extremely large army, perhaps hundreds of thousands of troops, he will not win. Because there are those within his own army who will work against him. His own leadership will work against him. And from what I can tell, is probably these three kings will start to work against him. So he will be betrayed, and they will not win like you might expect them to win. Listen to what Daniel 11.26 says, it gives us some details. Those who eat his choice food will destroy him, and his army will sweep away many, but many will fall slain. Now those who eat his choice food, well in those days, back in the days of Daniel, this would be those who basically were right under the king. That would be his, what we would call his administration or his staff, we call that today. But this would be his advisors and his officers and his leadership, uh, probably some of his military commanders, his governors. They would start to betray him. Now, remember, Satan is trying to get his Antichrist in control. And he's trying to fool the world. And I'll show you what he's trying to do in a moment. But Satan has control of these three kings. And his plan, Satan's plan, is to get this king of the south actually to go down under the king of the north so that the king of the north now listen carefully the king of the north who is the antichrist will defeat the king of the south alright he will take him down 
and then the Antichrist will appear to be the world's hero and he will demand the world's worship. So this is all a plot. Many already say that they think the Mahdi is the Antichrist. Well, then who would defeat the Antichrist? Well, in Scripture, it's Christ. So you see, the devil has his own plan to make this guy appear bad and this guy, the Antichrist, appear the hero. And people will think, who don't know the Scripture, that he must be the Christ. So this is a major way that Satan uses to get the Antichrist to be worshipped by the world. So understand, the Mahdi is not really the Antichrist. Now he will be against Christ, but he's not the Antichrist that will rule the world. It's pretty sneaky, isn't it? Well, Satan is slick, he's deceptive, and he deceives much of the world to get them to look to his man, the Antichrist, as the hero of dealing with all these rebellious Muslim nations. Rebellious in a sense they don't want to follow his man, the Antichrist. Well, we're still looking at that southern invasion. Listen to what happens next. These two kings, that's the kings of the north and the south, their hearts incline toward evil, and they will speak lies to each other at the same table, but it will not succeed, for there is still an end to come at the appointed time. Now this tells us that both men now have lost a lot of men in their armies. The king of the north has succeeded in defeating the king of the south. But he sits down with the king of the south and decides to do some negotiations. All right? That means they discuss what they're going to do, some sort of peace agreement. And it looks like <clears throat> that though the king of the north has conquered much of these kingdoms, he hasn't completely taken Egypt and North Africa, which is a bunch of countries across North Africa and down into it. So... Here the king of the north stops. He has these discussions with the king of the south and agrees to stop at this point. So he's come down into here and he stopped about maybe the border of Egypt. <clears throat> it says also they spoke lies to each other which means that the king of the north did not say what he really wanted to do and the king of the south didn't say what he really wanted to do. So whatever the talks are, we don't get the details. They don't tell each other the whole truth. In fact, they're probably just misleading each other. And what's going to happen is that the king of the north is going to go back, but on his way back, he goes into Israel. And this is where we have that first desecration. Let's look at verse 28. This is where it talks about him going back. Then he, the king of the north, will return to his land with much property. But his heart will be against the holy covenant, and he will take action, and then return to his own land. <clears throat> so what he does is on his way back to what we would call the Rome 1 area 
okay, he decides to go into Israel. And he goes into Jerusalem. And he goes into the temple. And now we're getting close. Let me show you where we are on the time scale. This is the middle of tribulation. This is the beginning of the tribulation. This is the end of the tribulation. We're about in here somewhere. Okay? Probably within the last year of the first half. Which puts us probably about to maybe the three year point of the tribulation. Alright? Remember it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years long. So right in this time, give or take a few months, you have your first invasion. Now he returns back to his land, but he also has his first desecration. Word, the big long word we just learned. It calls it the Holy Covenant. Now, if you remember that during this first half at the beginning of the tribulation, the temple was rebuilt by believers led by Moses and Elijah. They come back. Two of the great prophets the Old Testament. Moses, of course, is known for giving the law. Elijah is known for being a great prophet, standing, standing against great evil. So they get the temple rebuilt, and they start sacrifices again. But not sacrifices like they were from the first, back during the time of Moses. But now these sacrifices look back on the work of Christ. So if they killed an animal and they saw its blood, it reminded them of what Christ did on the cross. But anyway, they have this worship system in the temple and the Antichrist decides to start stopping some of these things. In fact, he is going to have Moses and Elijah killed. There's a great story about that. They are killed. He lays them out in the street for everybody to see. And after three days, they come back alive. And they go on up into heaven. So, what we're learning here is after this first invasion of the south, the Antichrist comes back and desecrates the temple and the temple area. The temple that was set up for the tribulation time. Now, after he does his first desecration, he doesn't destroy it, but he does start to change things. He starts to work against those people. He may pass some laws. He may make some limits on what they can do. Then he does that, and then he goes back to his own land, wherever his headquarters is in Europe. Now, the king of the north, the Antichrist, will begin to change his attitude toward the people and the land of Israel. Remember you had that seven year agreement with them? He's thinking about breaking it, and he starts to do things that will break it. So now he's back into Europe, and let me remind you what else is going on. I mentioned this in the last lesson. We have the trumpet judgments going on or the trumpet warning judgments going on remember there's seven of them so you go one two three four five six and the seventh opens up 
right here at the midpoint of the tribulation. Right about in here, before the seventh trumpet, he decides to go back down again and do a second invasion of the south. But this time he's going to go all the way in to, U to Egypt. So the red line is the second invasion. Now do you remember what happened during the sixth trumpet? The four killer angels are directed to kill one-third of mankind with these very strange creatures that are demon-like, horse-like creatures that kills millions of unbelievers. Maybe even a billion or so. But if there's 200 million demon creatures, you can expect that at least 200 million unbelievers will be killed. And there's about six and a half, I think, to seven billion people on the planet. So this will be a way in which Satan gets a lot of human beings off the earth. He doesn't care about them. But he will begin to kill a lot of people. Now this may sound horrible. And to your ears, it may sound like, man, that's a lot of people. But you got to remember, God is in control, and he's going to prepare all this for these seven years for the reign of Jesus. And these unbelievers have rejected his son. They rejected the gift of salvation through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It doesn't mean that God doesn't care for them. But since they've rejected his son, they've rejected the free gift of salvation. When they die, they are going to go down to hell anyway. Okay? But the devil, he likes sending them there. He don't care about them. He didn't do anything to save them. He's getting them out of the way so he can better rule. So he... <clears throat> uh, so he will suffer a great deal when these trumpet judgments come. All right? And these are warnings. These are warnings to the world that much worse is coming. And the Lord allows these angels, these, these killer angels, to go out with these demon horse-like creatures to kill billions of unbelievers. Now, Satan is in the business of murdering people. God is in the business of judging people for rejecting Christ. Let's remember the difference. The seventh trumpet is going to happen shortly after this, where the Antichrist will be allowed to take the throne in the millennium, excuse me, in the tribulational temple. All right? So, this warning judgment will get us ready for what's next. So, during this second invasion, the king of the north will begin to take over completely all the kingdoms of the south. And that's where we'll begin our next lesson on the second invasion and the second desecration of the temple. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We see it as challenging. We see it as something that we need to know, that we need to understand. And we ask that we might be clear in our thinking as we work through these teachings so that we can better follow you to have insight into your plan so we can be obedient 
to your will. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.